The title of the message today is Denying the Flesh. Uh, would you please say that out loud? Say, say, Denying the Flesh. Look to your neighbor and say, Don't go anywhere today. Don't, don't go anywhere. Denying the Flesh. Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to begin uh, with verse 5, if we can bring that up on the screen. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Now, the 2011 version here went back to the word flesh. In the 1984 version, they used the, the word sinful nature. And that's very, uh, uh, that explains it quite well. Uh, but if you read the New King James Version or the NASB, it'll use the word, the word flesh. The, the idea here, if you're new to reading the scriptures, is when you see the word flesh, it's closely tied to the sinful nature. But what I want to show us today is how much this earthly realm, how much this physical realm, is actually tied to the flesh. There, there's a lot of reasons why the scripture would uh, indicate it that way. So verse 5 says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. You could read it this way. Those who have their live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the sinful nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Verse 15, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought you about your redemption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 17, the Spirit, oh, verse 16, the Spirit, I'm having trouble because I'm not reading it from my Bible. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Say amen. So denying the flesh. Please say that one more time. Say denying the flesh. So I want to talk today about your physical health and your, your spiritual health. Uh, and to, to start this out, I want to say that we really need to contrast the realm of the spirit uh, and the realm of the flesh. Now, when, when you think of the physical realm, think of this, this earthly realm where we live, where we breathe, where there's, there's physicality. But you're also a very spiritual being. You're actually more spiritual than you are physical because this body is, is going to die. This body is going to pass away, but it's your soul, it's your spirit that, that's going to, to live forever. However, we're, we seem to be much more in tune with the physical realm, and God wants you as a biblical Christian to understand the difference between the, the physical realm and the spiritual realm, to understand uh, the difference between the realm of the spirit versus uh, the realm of the flesh. Now, when the Bible talks about flesh here, it's, it's really talking about uh, this earthliness, uh, this, uh, this, this sinful nature that, that we deal with. 
Uh, but we need to understand that there's a correlation really between this physical realm, our physical bodies, and our, our sinful nature. So let, let's talk about a correct understanding of physicality. So if we talk about your, your physical health for a moment, we need to understand a correct perception of, of physicality. First of all, God created you good. Say amen to that. Okay? So, so your, your physical body is a good thing. So having said that you're more spiritual, more of a spirit being than you are a physical being, uh, that's in no way saying that the physical side of you isn't good. God, God created all of you. He created spirit, soul, and body. And so we need to understand or have a correct understanding of physicality. Now, let's say it this way. There are some things about your physicality that you cannot help. There's nothing you can do about it. God made you that way. He made you with your DNA structure. He made you with your eyes. He made you with your, your fingerprints. He made you with a certain body type. He gave you a certain color of hair. Now, you can change that color of hair. Uh, you can change your physique. Uh, there's some things that you could, you could change, but there, but there are some things that you just cannot change about yourself. It's just the way that God made you. Now, I will preach most of the time on the fact that God loves you just the way he made you. That's really, really important because uh, many of us have struggled uh, with the way we look or the way we feel about ourselves. I'll bet if I were to sit down with you personally and ask you, what are the things you like about yourself and what are the things you don't like? It would be easy to talk about the things you don't like. Harder to talk about the things you like about yourself. But most of us, we're keenly aware of the things that we don't like. Maybe we don't like our physique, how our bodies are. Maybe we don't like our hair. Maybe we see the wrinkles uh, in our face. Uh, maybe we don't like our teeth. Uh, there's, there are things that, that we were just kind of born with that, uh, that we have to accept our, our humanity. And I will say this to you with confidence and with authority. You've got to accept how God made you. And he loves you, and he likes you just the way you are. Say amen to that. Okay, so that, that is really, really important, uh, because I think our society has put such an emphasis on this physical realm that oftentimes we feel like we're not measuring up, that we're not beautiful enough, we're not handsome enough, we're not athletic enough, we're not strong enough. We feel inferior, and we feel oftentimes very insecure. And so we have to hear God's word over and over and over again that says God made you in his image and he likes you the way you are. Say amen to that. Okay, that that's, that's really, really imper important for us to, to understand. So there are some things that we just can't ha help, but there are many things that we can change and we can take responsibility for, right? So you might be, you might have been born today with not very good teeth. And it is true. You can get a cavity uh, and you just, some people are born with great teeth and other people aren't bored with, with very good teeth. But how many people would agree if you don't brush your teeth, you're going to get cavities, right? So there, there, you might be bored with a certain weakness uh, physically, if you will, but if you don't take care of yourself, uh, there's going to be a gravitational pull uh, toward vulnerability. Uh, so there are some things I can't help, but then there are other things that, that I, can certainly, uh, I can certainly make a difference on. Now, I, I said this last week. We talked a little bit about the fact that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16 says, Don't you know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? So please say this out loud. Say, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Say that. Say it. I'm the, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it is important, even though you, uh, God loves you just the way you are. It doesn't change anything about his love. Uh, he loves you just the way you are. He does want you to take care of the temple. Okay? And so we said this last week, but, but I'll, I'll just I'll reiterate it. I think we would all agree today that if you abuse your body, that's not what God wants you to do, right? So as, if somebody's abusing their body with drugs, you're not taking care of, of your temple. 
Um, if you're abusing your body with alcohol, you're, you're not taking care of the temple. God, God wants you to take care of your temple. And, and notice this, the, the reason why he really does that is he loves you and he wants to protect you from pain. That's really the heart of that is he, he loves you so much he wants to, to protect you from pain. And so he wants us to live a moral life. He wants us to live a clean life. He wants us to take care of the temple of the Spirit. You are the temple of, of, God's, of God's Spirit. So, so that's, that's really important for us to understand. Now, when we talk about our physical health, there are benefits of being in health, being healthy, and being in shape. Okay, so if you're healthy today and you're in shape, you probably feel good about yourself. I know that when I'm not eating healthy and I'm not exercising, I, I don't really feel that great. Okay, so let me go over some of these things. What, what are the benefits to being healthy and in shape. Well, what does it reduce? It reduces, and I've written a bunch of things down here. Maybe you can think of some more. Uh, but it definitely reduces the risk of disease. If if we're living healthy lives, if we're if we're in shape, it reduces the risk of disease, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, cholesterol, arthritis, a risk of a stroke. It reduces anxiety reduces depression, it reduces unwanted weight, or the risk of injury. Do you know that being in health and being in good shape reduces back pain, certain types of cancer, inflammation, heart disease, aches, aches and pains, and lethargy. If you're in good shape, you start feeling a lot better about yourself physically. Okay? So those are some of the benefits of, of being healthy uh, in shape. It reduces things. What does it improve when you're healthy and in shape? Well, it actually improves your cognitive function. You're sharper mentally. How many people know you have more energy? You, you have more motivation if you're feeling good physically. It actually improves your self-esteem. Uh, you sleep better. There's better circulation in your body. Your metabolic rate is better. Your libido is better. Longevity, you actually can live longer. Your balance, your, your coordination, your digestion is better. Your focus, your immune system, even your, your whole mood and, and your productivity level all increases when you're in shape and you're doing well physically, when you are healthy. And so the, these are the benefits. This would be the, the appeal of, of getting in shape. And so this is, our, this is our physical health. I know we don't talk about this a lot in church, uh, but it, if we are physical and spiritual beings, it's important that we, actually, that we actually think about some of these things. And we're going to see today that there's a correlation between my physical health and my, my spiritual health. So this is the physical side of it. I, I think all of us would agree that uh, if we're in shape or doing well physically, we feel good about ourselves. All I can do is testify that when I'm not in shape physically, I, I, I don't feel as good. I don't, I don't have the energy. There's more lethargy. I'm not as sharp mentally. It affects every area. I, I've noticed, especially as I get older, that I can get, I, I get back aches. I, I, I can feel the inflammation uh, when I'm not eating right. All of those things are indicative of, of not being in shape, not taking care of myself physically. So th that's, that's our physical health, and I just, I just lead in with that. But let's talk about our spiritual health. Now, I want to read to you Romans 14 and verse 17 because I don't want to lose you guys, and, and I don't want you to think that, that this is that this is some sort of a seminar on, on getting in shape. That's not what it is all. Listen to, to Romans 14 and verse uh, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So, so that's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is more on the, the spiritual side of things. Okay, But I want us to really be thinking about about the physical side as well. So again, 
The important thing is the spirituality, but physicality is clearly tied in to some of these things. So, so spirituality is more important than, than physicality. But now let's contrast the realm of the flesh with the realm of the spirit. And I'm going to ask you to go to, to Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Okay? Now, again, the realm of the flesh speaks really of your sinful nature. Okay? But there are good things about your body. That's not what the Bible's saying at all, is that, oh, suddenly the body's bad or anything. You know, there were whole groups of people even in the first century that heard about that, and so they thought the, the, the body was bad. No, not at all. God made the body. The body is, is good, but it's when things get out of, out of balance. And so the Bible talks about the flesh like being the sinful nature, and we're going to contrast the sinful nature to the, to the realm of the Spirit. So this is Galatians 5, and we'll look at verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under law. Now he begins to tell us what the sinful nature is all about. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's the sinful nature. That's the the flesh, okay? That's, That's the... Uh, the way of the flesh, the realm of the flesh. Contrast that to the realm of the Spirit, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have, been cruci- have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So you can see the difference between the sinful nature and the realm of the flesh versus the the realm of the Spirit. And so we live in this world where there's a lot of temptation and there's the realm of the flesh. God doesn't want you to gravitate toward the things of the flesh. He wants you to soar to the things of the Spirit. And so we see the difference between the realm of the flesh and and the realm of the Spirit. Now, having contrasted that, I just want to say this. There's this connection between the physical realm and the spirit realm because we are both physical and we're spiritual. So we live in in this realm where there's always going to be temptation for physical things and to be pulled toward the sins of the flesh, but the Bible says that we're not supposed to be of the world. We might be in it, but we're not of the world. He wants us to live in the realm of the Spirit. Say amen to that, okay? So when we think about the physicality of things, I want you, and I want to encourage us to really think about the fact that we're supposed to be whole and integrated, integrated beings. I've got, I've got the physical side of me, and I've got the, the emotional and mental side of me, and, and that's my, my soul, that's my heart that the Bible talks about. And then I've got the spiritual side of me, my spirit, where the Holy Spirit dwells. But you are one person, you're integrated, you're not supposed to be separated in any way, you're, you're one whole person. So here's the point, is that my physicality can affect my spirituality. And my spirituality can affect my my physicality. And so the Lord really wants us to to really get get a hold of this in in, in a powerful way. So the, the thing about fasting, what fasting does, is that fasting allows us to die to the to the fleshly realm and allow us to come alive in the spirit realm. So let's look at Matthew 
chapter 6 and, and, and talk for a moment about the mystery of fasting, the mystery of fasting. This is Matthew 6, and I want to talk about verses 16 to 18. So Jesus is talking here, and he says, when you fast. Everyone say, when you fast, okay? So there was a clear expectation that fasting was part of walking with the Lord. It was part of the Christian lifestyle. When you fast. Uh, so there was an expectation that they, they were going to fast. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What Jesus was saying was that when you fast, it's about your heart. It's about you walking with the Lord. It's not about an outward show uh, that you think that you're more spiritual than somebody else. It says people don't even actually really have to know that, that you're fasting. Uh, but notice this. He says, when you fast. Say that out loud. Say, say when you fast. When you fast. So there was an expectation that this would be part uh, of, of, our, of our spirituality. So let's define fasting. Fasting, to fast, means to let go of an appetite and seek God in a deeper way. So again, think about the contrast between the, the flesh and the spirit, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. If I fast, that means I let go of an appetite so that I can seek God in a deeper way. Uh, would you be willing for the next season that we have as a church, would you be willing to let go of some appetites so that you can seek God in a deeper way? That, that's what fasting means. That's what fasting is all about. Fasting is going without something, and it's usually food. There are some examples in the scripture where you can go without something else. But to be honest, it's, it's usually food and that's so that you can focus on, on God, okay? Because food is such a part of life. Food is such a part of this physical realm. Food is such a part of, of the flesh. And so there's this mystery in fasting that when you, you deny the very sustenance of life, when you go without food uh, and you begin to, to seek the Lord, that what happens is your flesh, albeit your body isn't necessarily a bad thing, but because it's so closely tied, your flesh is denied and you become more alive or heightened spiritually. So it becomes all interconnected. Uh, so if I'm willing to go without food, uh, at first your flesh uh, screams out, but you quiet the flesh and you're heightened spiritually. And now you can see from the scriptures we read how connected they are. And I found out this, that, that when I'm in tune with these things and I am, I am denying not just food, but I'm denying the whole realm of the flesh, that there is a spiritual heightenedness and I'm more in tune with the things of the Spirit. So I want to invite you to, to really think about going on a, on a fast to deny the flesh so that we can be more in tune with the things of the Spirit. So let me, let me define some of the fasts for us just to, to refresh our memory. There, there's different fasts in the Scripture, and we can put these up on the screen. We're not going to look at, at all of the verses today, but I just want to uh, define them. The first one that the Scripture talks about is an absolute fast. An absolute fast would be to go without food or water. The scriptural example is in Esther and also in Acts chapter 9 with Paul. Uh, really, the scriptural example was three days. So if it was really in your heart to go without food or water, I would encourage you, don't go much longer than three days. You can, you can push it, but your body needs water. Your body needs liquid, it needs food. So the scriptural example is, is three days. That is not easy to do. Uh, if you've done that before, it, it really is quite a challenging thing. But that, that's one fast. Uh, another fast is just the normal fast. And the normal fast is liquid only. It's without food and liquids. Typically in the scripture, the example would be, would be water. 
but the, the Bible's actually silent on this, uh, on whether or not you could drink other liquids. There are some people that, that would say uh, you can't have any kind of juices or anything. The Bible, the Bible is actually silent on that, but be, be spirit-led on this. So liquids only, that could be juices, uh, it could be uh, coffee, Probably coffee's okay. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is going without something, right, in order to focus on the Lord. And so what would you give up? Would you give up uh, a certain kind of a, a liquid uh, in order to focus more on the Lord? Then the Bible talks about partial fasting. So a partial fast would be only certain food groups. Okay, So this would be... Uh, what we often call a Daniel fast, because this would be the example. So in Daniel, it was just vegetables and water. Uh, you might want to add fruit, uh, but it's only certain food groups. You might say to yourself, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go without sugar. I'm going to go without carbs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny my, my flesh certain things so that I can, I can focus on the Lord. What, what would you give up? It's that idea of, of giving, going without something so that you can you can focus on the Lord. So that's a, that's a partial fast. Then there's a, a diverse fast. A diverse fast is from other things. The example in the scripture here was of the king, and he went without entertainment. Uh, maybe that would be in your heart to say, you know what, I'm going to take a break from social media. I'm going to take a break from entertainment. I'm, I'm not going to watch movies, or I'm not going to watch TV, or I'm not going to watch the news uh, uh, but that, that could be a powerful thing. I would say that this sometimes is more powerful than going without food. Because uh, you might be going without food, but watching all the wrong stuff. Say amen to that, right? So this would be what, a, a, diverse, a diverse fast. And then the Bible talks about a corporate fast, where we do something as a group <clears throat> or as a congregation. So the example of Jesus is that... When you fast, you don't need to let everybody know. If I'm fasting, I don't need to tell everybody. It doesn't to, to make me sound more spiritual or something like that. But then there are times that we do something as, as a group, and there's motivation in that. There's accountability in that, and there's really momentum in that, where we, where we fast together as a group, where we, where we pray together. And this is very, very scriptural, where in Joel, they were calling out for revival, and there was a a corporate fast. So those are, those are some, some examples of fasting. You can do any kind of fast. I just want to challenge you toward, toward growth and say, hey, do I, do I want to do, do this this year? Now, I do want to say this. Who should not fast? Is it possible that somebody should not fast? I'm going to say if you're pregnant today, you don't need to fast. You need to feed baby, right? So Expecting mothers, uh, but, but having said that, you can fast from something else, right? Uh, you could fast from certain food groups or from entertainment, um, or if you have a medical condition that requires you to take food. That, so it would be wise if, if you do that so that you can, you can take the medicine. But let me say this, having said that, I've seen people get healed from certain things and medication that, that, they, that they no longer needed after they went on the fast. But the point is, you got to be very spirit-led in this and be very, very wise. So, so that would be just something that we would say is, is, is pretty important, who, who maybe should not <clears throat> fast. So let me give you some ideas. You might be thinking, when you came here today, and, and people are staying away by the hundreds and thousands because we're talking about fasting and praying. Uh, but maybe this is new to you. You know, as a church, we start out every year and we do, you know, we do 40 days of fasting. So this might be new. So what are some ideas? Here's some ideas. You might just want to do one meal a day. Uh, if, if fasting is new to you, train yourself. Uh, just say, you don't have to do, be like Jesus and go 40 days on, on just water. Uh, you could do one meal a day or maybe two meals a day. Or again, a certain food group. You might want to say, eat vegetables, okay? Or you might say, you know what? No sugar in our house. We're not going to do sugar. And you can bring your kids in on that. We've done this every year with our kids. And sometimes we might say, uh, well, we're not going to watch movies or we're not going to uh, watch uh, you know, TV. 
you might decide as a family, you know what, instead of doing a, a movie night, we're going to do a game night. Uh, you're going to do something a little bit different. There's many, many different ideas. Uh, so again, you can do one day, you can uh, do two days, you can do three days. You, if fasting is new to you, uh, you can jump right in. You certainly can, but there, it's not going to be easy. But I've found that if you train yourself to this and you start, okay, I'm going to do a one-day fast or I'm going to do a three-day fast, then you take a break and you train yourself. I didn't do a 40-day fast until I had done a three-day fast, until I had done a seven-day fast, a 10-day, and still I went three weeks. I, I trained myself to do this. And having said I trained myself, it's still difficult. It's not easy. Uh, but... Uh, I just want to encourage you little by little. And, and we can talk about this if you guys ha have questions, but I, I really want you to, to think about that. Now, why do we do 40 days? Because many churches do 21 days, but we've always felt in our spirit to do 40 days. We started out as a church always doing 40 days, that season of six weeks of just fasting and praying. It doesn't mean that everybody went 40 days. Uh, but as a church, we were in the season of prayer. Some people would do a few days. Some people would do a week. Some people would try uh, to do, you know, a three-day fast and then take a break and then do a media fast or whatever. But it's a concerted effort for, for six weeks. Uh, I, we tried 21 days for a couple of years. And, uh, and I know that's a real popular one, uh, the 21-day Daniel fast. I think it's a, it's, it's a great one. But it just didn't feel right in my spirit. I just have felt the Lord wants us to do, to do 40 days. Now, now why, why 40? Uh, because, and I've done whole teachings on, on the 40. If you go through the scripture, you can kind of see some things that happen in, in 40 days. But I'll just say it this way today. 40 days can break habits and develop new habits. If you do something for 40 days and read your Bible for 40 days, if you, if you really press in for 40 days, it can, it can break something in, in your life. If you're extremely dependent, let's just talk about in the natural. If you're extremely dependent on sugar and you fast from sugar, the first few days are going to be really hurtful. Uh, you're going to feel it. I know I'm going to feel my fast tomorrow because I haven't been eating real good. I've been enjoying every Christmas cookie and... <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. I have been off the rails. Uh, and so I know I'm going to feel it. I'm going to be detoxed. And, uh, you're going to feel it. But after you get through the, the rough part, it, th there's a benefit that comes. There's a, there's a blessing that really comes. You start feeling it physically, but I'm going to show you in a second. You start feeling it spiritually as well. Uh, so, so 40 days can break habits. It can break habits physically, but you know it can break things in the spirit realm as well. Uh, so there's, there's something about the 40 days when you look at all the scriptures uh, where there were 40 days. So 40 days can break habits and, and begin to form new ones. So we have just felt in our spirit that we would have six weeks of, of concerted effort. Okay? Now, I stress and underscore this all the time. No legalism. Everybody say that, no legalism, okay? And I think we've done a good job of that. We invite people, uh, people that really want to learn about this and grow. We say, come on the journey with us. But none of us act like we're more spiritual. No, we're keenly aware of our humanity. So we're not acting more spiritual just because we fast and, and somebody else doesn't fast. So I don't want you to disappear for six weeks. Everyone say amen to that, okay? If you do not feel led to fast, it's okay. God bless you. But as a church, we're, we're just having this season of, of focused prayer uh, and praying uh, together. Now, I will say this. I want to challenge all of us. Everybody just tell me you love me for a second, okay? I don't really feel it. Build me, build me. Tell me you love me. Everybody say, I'm not going anywhere. All right, you're not going, all right, you're not going anywhere. Okay. All right, so, so I want to challenge you. I really, I really think, I mean, it, I, I, I really know, and, and maybe we all have different situations and conditions, but I, I really think we could all do a Daniel fast. We, we actually could. Uh, and we could certainly do it for 21 days if we really wanted. And, and once you get going, uh, 
uh, you, can, you can actually go six weeks. I mean, there, there's a, think about a Daniel fast. There are so many, some people have gotten, you get on the internet, people have gotten so creative uh, with the Daniel fast. It's amazing. You won't even feel like you're, you're fasting. Uh, but we could actually all do this. So I, I just want to encourage you to really think about that. You know, pray about it, you know, even if it was for one week or you said, okay, as a family, we're going to try two weeks or three weeks or maybe it's the the whole time. Eating certain food groups and going without some of the stuff that doesn't make us feel that great anyway is a good thing. Say amen to that, okay? And so it's so closely tied. It's actually uh, so closely integrated. So let me move quickly. Let me just give you some practical suggestions on fasting, okay? So if you do go this route, even if you do a, a Daniel fast, I, I just encourage you, drink lots of water. Drink lots of water. You know, your body is more than 70% water. Uh, do you know that even 30% of your bones are water? Uh, so water does a lot of things. It helps you with digestion. It eliminates toxins. Uh, it helps your blood circulation. helps you maintain your energy level. Um, there's a lot that, that water does. Uh, drink juices. Now, having said that, be careful of the sugar content. Because when you go get juices, there, there can be a lot of, lot of sugar in that. But if you're, if you're going to go on a prolonged fast, juicing will actually help you uh, detox. And it'll help it be less painful. So when I fast and I just do water, man, I feel it. You start getting body aches and everything, especially if you haven't been eating good. It's detoxing. But if I, if I juice, and I, I'm, I'm doing more natural juices, not all the sugar, but if I, if I do that, it helps the detoxification. It's, it's much less painful. And to be honest with you, it keeps the colon in the game. And that, that makes it a lot easier on things. Less muscle loss, less strain on the liver. It helps keep your metabolism stable, you know, those kind of things. You actually have more energy with with juicing. So drink lots of water. You might do juice. You might, you might want to do other liquids. It's, it is okay. I mean, you could drink soup broth. Oftentimes I'll go from doing water and then I'll add soup broth. Uh, some people can't drink milk on an empty stomach. I can. Some people won't do coffee at all during a fast. I actually do coffee during, during a fast. So it, it depends. You might want to drink hot water. Pastor Lee told me he adds a little bit of salt uh, to his water. There's, there's different things you can do. You can do smoothies, but remember, smoothies are just blended fruit, right? So it depends what kind of, of fast that, that you're doing. And then here's the big thing. Read the Word. Pray. Do the spiritual side of it, because the whole point is that you're going without so that you can focus on doing more for the Lord. And as you come to the Lord, you say, I'm denying this fleshly realm because I want to be more heightened to the, to the spiritual realm. So pray and, and read the, the word. Now, what are the rewards of fasting? If you'll go for this. Physically, you're going to feel a lot better. If you go without a certain amount of sugar or carbs, uh, you're going to just start feeling better. At first, you might feel rotten because you're detoxing. But after you get through it, you're going you're gonna to feel better, and you're actually going to have more energy. Uh, so you'll have detoxified a little bit, and you're actually going to, you'll have lost a, li- a little bit of weight. That's a pretty good benefit, especially for those of us uh, that are older. Uh, so you, 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 you'll lose a little bit of weight. That You're going to feel better. You're going to have more energy. But what are the spiritual benefits? You're gonna, you will have regained your spiritual edge. When you fast, you gain a spiritual edge, and you're going to have much more intimacy with the Lord. So I found out this. When I fast, I'm more humble. I have more peace. And at the end of the fasting, I feel much more refreshed in the Lord. So notice how it works physically. If you were, and even people in the world, they'll tell you this. Oh, you got to juice, and you got to do this. Take, you know, give your body a break. And then they feel much better physically. Well, you take that and you multiply it by 100 and you add the spiritual component, you're going to be on fire because you you will deny the physical realm. You'll feel much more physically, but you've added the spiritual component to it and you're just going to feel much, much more refreshed. So I want to invite you 
to maybe pray about and dedicate and commit and say, you know what, maybe I would go on a fast this year. Can you say amen, church? So let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet.